We've been uh, going through the minor prophets in the Old Testament. And uh, it's been amazing to me as I read through these prophecies how current they are, how really pertinent they are to the time we're living in, even today. Tonight we're going to be going through the prophet Obadiah. And Obadiah, if you, uh, if you blink, you'll miss it. It's only one chapter, 21 verses. It's just a short book, but it's a powerful prophecy, and it's a prophecy that has, uh, as I said, it's pertinent for today, because we're seeing, what we're seeing happening in the world today, especially in the Middle East, is really a fulfillment of some of the things we're reading in Obadiah. Uh, Obadiah, the fate of Esau, the man of the flesh. Now, you might say, what does that have to do with anything? E Obadiah was a prophet, and he prophesied about the nation Edom. E-D-O-M, Edom, and we're going to talk about them in a minute. The Edomites were descendants of Esau. Now, if we remember, uh, Esau, if you remember the story in Genesis when we were going through the book of Genesis, Esau and Jacob were twin brothers, or they were fraternal twins. They didn't look like each other, but they were born at the same time. Esau was born first, and Jacob came out right after him holding on to his heel, okay, God, for some reason, chose Jacob to be the one through whom the promised seed would come. He prophesied that the, the older would serve the younger. So uh, we know the story about Esau and, and, uh, and Jacob. And again, you can read through those stories in Genesis. We're not going to go into detail. But we know uh, the first thing we read about Esau was the fact that he sold his birthright. You remember the story that when... Uh, Esau was coming back. Esau was a man of the field. He was a hunter, and he was like a man's man. And Jacob was like, like the mama's boy, you know, back at home. And Esau came back from hunting, and uh, Jacob had a pot of stew on a pot of soup on the on the on the flame there. And Esau said, "Man, I'm so hungry, I could die. Give me some of that soup." And Jacob said, "I'll give you some if you sell me your birthright." And Esau says, "Who needs the birthright? I'm hungry. I'm going to die if you don't feed me." So. He sold him his birthright. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but back in those days, a birthright was the right of the firstborn. Jacob, I'm sorry, Esau despised his birthright. Okay, and he sold it to Jacob. Esau went on to marry Canaanite women. Probably say, well, what's the big deal with that? Well, again, to keep the seed pure, all through, if you all, when we were studying Genesis, we read how important it was for the, for the family through whom Messiah would come would keep the seed pure. Well, Esau didn't do that. Okay. In Genesis 26, in uh, verse 34, Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beeri of the Hittite, uh, the Bashamite and all those names. Uh, they were a grief. Uh, Isaac and Rebekah, when they found out Esau was marrying foreign women, Canaanite women, that was a grief to them. They realized that he was, he was throwing away what was rightfully his. Now Esau, his descendants became the nation of Edom. I have a map here, and it's a little blurry, but some of you might see it. This is a map of the ancient, uh, the ancient tribes. I think, does this have a light? Yeah, yeah, it does. Okay. You see the little light there? Okay. Now if you would look at a, a regular map, or a, a current map today of the Middle East, you would see, oh, wrong button. Okay. You would see there's Israel today, okay? And down here would be Egypt over here and Saudi Arabia and so forth. This would be Jordan. There's the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River, okay? Uh, this would be Jordan. You see there is the uh, Aram and Damascus. Uh, Syria would be, would be today Syria. There's the uh, Ammonites. The Moabites, and down here you see the kingdom of Edom. This is where they settled, the descendants of Esau. Okay, uh, In other places in, in the Old Testament, they're called Mount Seir, S-I-E-R. Right? And this is a map of that, of that time. Now, after many years later, when the Israelites were coming when they had escaped Egypt and they were traveling toward the promised land. The Edomites refused to let them through their land. They denied Israel passage on their way to the promised land. They were constant enemies to Israel. All through, there was never a time when Israel and Edom were like in league with each other. They were always enemies to each other. And when Nebuchadnezzar came, 
to conquer Jerusalem uh, because of their idolatry, Edom sided with Nebuchadnezzar. He they actually aided Nebuchadnezzar in his conquest of Jerusalem. Now, as time went on, okay, during the time between the Testaments, between Malachi and uh, Matthew and the coming of John the Baptist, there was like 400 years. And during that time, the Edomites, this kind of history might be a little dry, but just to, so you get a handle on what's going on, because we're going to bring this to, a, to today in just a little bit. They, uh, they, they began to uh, move around a little bit, and they kind of lost their power, and they began to settle uh, in the southern part, pretty much where they were before, but also just a little to the north of that. Hebron, if you hear today, you hear the name Hebron, the city of Hebron. Well, that was like the center of where they were. And they became, during the, uh, the times of Jesus, they were called the Idumeans. Instead of Edomites, they were the Idumeans. That's a Greek word. Now, who was a famous Idumean? Anybody know? Any guess? The buzzer's going to go off here. <laughs> the, the, a famous, it was the Herods were Idumeans, King Herod. And all that there were about four or five different Herods who were kings. There was Herod the Great, and then his his uh, family members. They were they were Idumeans. They were considered half breed Jews. Okay, Edomites kind of inbred with some of the Jews and so forth. There was Idumea. Now uh, here's another map, and it shows you uh, more uh, uh, that was closer to Jesus' time. Uh, in the first century, okay, there's Galilee. We know Jesus came from Galilee. And there's Samaria. And there's Ju Judea. And here to the south of Judea is Idumea. Uh, here is, was the old land of Edom. But again, they kind of migrated up here. Uh, and here, here uh, if, here's a blow-up of, there's Hebron right there. And guess, guess what that looks like today? That looks like what they call the West Bank, right? The West Bank. Okay, now I'm, I'm, I'm going to go somewhere with this. The West Bank is that area that in the uh, 1967 war, Israel conquered that, that West Bank and, and captured all of Jerusalem. And that's, this, that's the, the land that the, the, the Palestinians want, want them to give back. Okay, you know, they want them to cut their country in half, okay, which is like right around in here. Now, now we'll, we'll get there in a minute. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. Edom... Throughout the Old Testament, their judgment was spoken of by all these prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Malachi. They all pronounced judgment on Edom, on the Edomites, okay? In Ezekiel 35, he says this. Because thou hast had a perpetual hatred, a perpetual hatred, the Edomites and really many of, the, of those tribes in that area, have had a perpetual, that means an everlasting hatred. There's never been a time when they've been buddies. Because you've had a perpetual hatred and has shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time that their iniquity had an end. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, I will prepare thee unto blood, and blood shall pursue thee. Uh, since thou hast not hated blood, even blood shall pursue thee. Thus will I make Mount Seir most desolate and cut off from it, him that passes out and him that returns. So what God was speaking through Ezekiel is the utter destruction of Edom because of their hatred of Israel. Now, again, you can look historically at, at this, and there's never been a clear-cut time when that has happened. I just want to show you before we get into Obadiah. The character of the ancient Edomites is alive and well. And spiritually, and in the natural, in the people called the Palestinians. Now, today we keep hearing about the Palestinian homeland. Do you know that there has never been a Palestinian homeland? These, these group of people called the Edomites, or called the Palestinians, who are Edomites, have been wandering people for years, and no Arab nation has wanted to give them a place to live. But they, they claim that their land, their homeland, is that thing we call the West Bank. Okay? Now, we're, in a minute, we're going to talk about, we're going to look into this a little bit closer. Uh, in Psalm 83, and we did a, a message on Psalm 83 one time. We did a teaching on that. It's a good one to read. Psalm 83 talks about a war. It says, 
Well, let, let me turn to it and start with, from verse 1, and so we can just read that. Because it really does tie in with Obadiah. Um, in Psalm 83, it's a prophetic psalm, <laughs> and it says, It's a song of Asaph, who was a high priest in Israel. Keep not thou silence, O God, hold not thy peace, and be not still. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. Now, somebody might read this and say, well, there have always been people that hated Israel. Well, let's read on a little bit more. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted against the hidden ones. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. That could be a headline in today's paper. This, is, this is, was the stated goal of the Palestinian Liberation Army, uh, Army Hamas, uh, and the others that have, have declared and have dedicated their existence to the destruction of Israel. Okay, now listen to what they say. Verse 5. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. The first one they mention are the tabernacles or the tents of Edom. Referring to them as a, as a nomadic people having tents, living in tents. And the Ishmaelites of Moab and the Hagarines, uh, Gebel and Ammon and Amalek and the Philistines and the inhabitants of Tyre. When we did a message on this, we went through a detailed uh, description of each one of these names mentioned here has a, has a modern day counterpart. This, this war described in Psalm 83 hasn't happened yet. It's prophetic. It's coming. It's happening right now. When we read about what they call the Arab Spring, and we read about all the changes, you know, what has happened in Egypt and the revolt, the so-called, quote-unquote, democratic, you know, they want democracy. It's not turning into a democracy. It's turning into an Islamic uh, theocracy. And that's what's happening in Syria, where these, these leaders are killing their own people. And the Islamic Brotherhood just loves this stuff. And it's, it's, it happened in Yemen, Saudi Arabia. All these nations have, have this, this element within their people of, of revolt, not, not for more freedom or for more democracy, but for more radical Islam. Just like Iran. Some of you might not be old enough to remember Ayatollah Khomeini. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, <laughs> I, remember, I remember hearing about Ayatollah Khomeini thinking, man, I, I quit watching the news for about six months. When they took them American captives, interesting, the day Ronald Reagan got elected, they let him go, but that's another story. But anyway, okay, but yeah, this is what's happening in these nations. And these nations that are named here in Psalm 83 are these same nations where this stuff is going on. All right, now, listen to what it says here in Psalm 83. Asher is joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot and, and so forth. Okay, uh, okay, he goes on. We're, we're going to stop with Psalm 83. But that's, if you can read it and study it out, you'll find out that it's a, pro, a prophecy that's speaking of, of, of a, a war that's coming. Okay. Now, here's, here's what I'm going to tell you, and this is what I believe is going to happen. Now, this is just my opinion, and you can reject it or accept or reject it. There's going to be this, this confederation against Israel, Every Arab nation is going to come against Israel, and they're going to be defeated soundly. Not because of the help of the United States of America, but because of the help of the Lord, the Lord whose Israel is his nation. This is before, this is before Christ returns. I, this might even be before the rapture. We might see this happen. Okay. Israel, because of their great victory, is going to amass a great amount of land. And that's going to spark what's eventually going to become the Armageddon the, uh, you know, Moscow and Russia and so forth and Iran. That's just my opinion. I could be wrong about that, okay? But all this stuff is prophesied. And somebody's going to say, well, what does that have to do with Obadiah? Well, the prophet Obadiah, which is only 21 verses long, deals with God's dealing with the nation of Edom. In Obadiah, there's only one chapter. So I don't have to call a chapter. In verse 1, we don't know anything about Obadiah. We don't know where it came from. We don't know who his father was. We don't know 
we, we really don't even know the time of this prophecy, probably about the same time as Joel, but we're really not sure. The vision of Obadiah, that says the Lord God concerning whom? Concerning Edom. We've heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen, thou art greatly despised. God had no love for the nation of Edom. Now listen, this isn't excluding individuals that could be saved, you know, because there are Palestinian Christians, there are Jewish Christians, there's, God is moving in all different, different uh, nationalities. But we're talking about a nation now. It's just like when uh, in, in uh, Malachi it says, uh, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. It's not so much speaking about the individuals, but the nations that came out of their loins, okay? He says... I'm, I'm rising everybody up against you, Edom. He says, your, the pride of your heart has deceived you. You that dwell in the cleft of the rock, whose habitation is high, that says in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? They dwelled in the clefts of the rock. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of a city named Petra. Have you ever heard of that? It's, it's there today. It's ruins. I got some pictures. I've never been there, so I didn't take the pictures myself, but I stole them off the Internet. Here's the entrance into the city of Petra. That's the only way to get in. Just a couple yards wide through the rocks there, okay? This is why when the scripture said they, were, they, were, they felt like they were in, in undefeatable, impenetrable, because they were living in these rocks, and that was the only way in or out, okay? They literally built a city in the rocks. They, they dug out the rocks and built, you know, temples and chapels and and so forth, in the rocks. This is, this is where they lived. That was their defense. It was a natural fortress. You see, they built these, you know, it must have took some time to do that. They didn't have uh, caterpillars and, and jackhammers and, okay. This was their amphitheater in that city, where they would, they would meet and have perhaps uh, entertainment and public meetings. Now, this is there today. It's in the southern part of Jordan. They would look at the, the, the temples and so forth that they were built. This is where they lived. This is why when, when Obadiah said, you know, you think you're safe. And it's sure from the looks of it, I mean, they had rocks. You know, they didn't have dynamite back then. They didn't have bombs that they could throw into the place. If somebody wanted to attack a city, they had to lay siege and so forth and burn the walls down. Well, they couldn't burn rock down. So the Edomites, they thought they were pretty, they were solid. They were living in a rock. It says in verse 4, Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence I will I bring thee down, says the Lord. You know, I didn't get a chance to find it, but they say the Palestinians, one of their, one of their uh, symbols is an eagle. The PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Army. Okay, Just reading on here a little bit more. If these came to, be, if it came to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If the grape gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? What he's saying is, you know what? Even when a thief comes and he leaves something, he's, but God's telling the Edomites, you're going to be wiped out completely. You're going to be completely erased. How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? All the men of your confederacy, now listen to this prophecy. All the men of your confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee that uh, they that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding him. Listen, here's what's going to happen that I believe with all my heart. This, that confederacy we talked about in Psalm 83, do you know what's happening right now? is the Arab world is using the Palestinians as a pawn. They're a pawn. They're using this idea of a Palestinian homeland, which never existed, as a reason to try to get land off of Israel. Now, Israel has already given back the Gaza Strip and other pieces of land that they got in that 1967 war. They want the Golan Heights so they can you know, shoot missiles at them. They want the West Bank so they could almost cut their nation right in half. Are they doing this for the, for the sake of the, the poor Palestinians that don't have a home to live in? 
You know, Palestinians can live in Israel right now along with anybody else. They're not treated. They're not mistreated. They have jobs. They have homes. What's the idea of a Palestinian homeland? It has nothing to do with a homeland. It has to do with the destruction of Israel. And what Obadiah is telling us, I believe, and what we read in Psalm 83, that the Arab world, the world that wants to see, not only the Arabs, but most of the world, who want to see Israel destroyed, they'll use the Palestinians as a pawn until they don't need them anymore. Because if they really cared about them, Jordan would give them a place to live. Saudi Arabia would give them a place to live. Egypt would give them a place to live. But they have to have that place called Israel, the place that God had promised to Jacob. Okay? In verse 8. Shall I not in that day, says the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of the Mount of Esau? And I mighty men, O Tim, in, in, uh, cities in, in Edom, shall be dismayed to the end that every one of the Mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. For your violence against your brother Jacob, you see, all the things they had done against Israel from the very beginning, from the fact that they wouldn't let them pass through their land during their exodus into the promised land. From, the, from, from, from all that's happened in history, from the time when they helped Nebuchadnezzar. Listen to, listen to what he says. In the day that you stood on the other side, in the day when the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even now was his one. You sided with the enemy, Edom. You didn't stand with your brother. And really, Jacob and Edom were brothers. He turned his back on them. The nation turned their back on Israel. He says, but you should not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. Neither should thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither should thou have spoken proudly. They, they rejoiced. They were so happy to see Israel carried away captive because of what Ezekiel called the perpetual hatred. See, this is what we're seeing being played out in the world today. There will not be any peace in the Middle East because there's a perpetual hatred that cannot be set aside just by a peace treaty. And that's what they're shooting for. You know, give us land, we'll stop the bombings. They'll never stop the bombings because their goal is the destruction of Israel. You should not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. You should not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance. When, as Israel was being carried away, the Edomites came in and stripped the place. Plundered, pillaged. You know, sucked up everything they could find off their brother. That they should have been defending. Not only that, but neither should they have stood in the crossway. They actually cut off their routes of escape. They did everything they could to help the enemy against Israel. See, this goes back to what, Ab what God told Abraham. He said, whoever blesses you, I will bless. And whoever curses you, I will curse. See, this is why as our nation continues to turn their back on Israel. See, we're... we're we're, we're getting to the place as a nation, not as individuals, but as a nation, we're getting to the place of the Edomites. We're siding with the enemy. Officially, our administration is siding with the enemy. We talk a game, we talk a good game about yeah, Israel. I don't know if you've ever heard this story. I told it once, and I, I heard a couple weeks ago, Chuck and I were down in my office, and I had my uh, TV on, or I had the computer on, and I had it on Sky Angel, and I was watching, somebody was talking to a, they were interviewing this guy that made this movie <laughs> about Israel and about how God has, has moved on their behalf. And during the, the uh, 1973 war, and some of you, again, probably weren't around, <laughs> okay, but Richard Nixon was the president, and Richard Nixon was going through the Watergate scandal, okay? He was just, that was just happening. And Golda Meir contacted, the, 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 the Secretary of State then was a guy named Henry Kissinger. How many people remember Henry Kissinger? Uh, I, I, maybe, you've heard, maybe I've told the story before. I'll tell it again. Uh, so, so Golda Meir contacted Henry Kissinger and said, 
listen, if you don't help us, we're going to be destroyed. And Henry Kissinger, who was a Jew, said, hey, you're on your own. So Gola Mayer called Richard Nixon at 3 o'clock in the morning and said, look, if you don't help us, we're going to be destroyed. And Richard Nixon, who was about ready to get impeached because of the Watergate thing, he was not a friend of Israel. He was not a pro. He really didn't do a whole lot for Israel. But his, he, this, is, this guy told this story. His mother told him when he was a kid, because his mother was a Quaker, his mother said, hey, someday, someday, Dick, Dickie, okay, Richard Nixon, someday, someday Richard, you're going you're gonna to be a friend of Israel. You're going to do something great for God's people Israel. And he remembered his mother told him that. And he went ahead and he, he signed the executive order, anything they need, give him. And it kept Israel from destruction in the 1973 war. It also kind of signed his impeachment warrant. Okay. God, listen, in our nation, while Richard Nixon suffered his fate because of things he had done, our nation has been blessed because we have been, because we have been friends of Israel. That we have stood for them. But now what's happening is we're turning against them. We're withdrawing our support. We're beginning to support their enemies. And don't think for a minute that if we do that, that we're not going to suffer the fate that their other enemies have suffered. Because God said, whoever blesses you, I will bless. And whoever curses you, I will curse. The Edomites are going to suffer great destruction. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As you have done, it shall be done unto you. Boy, there's a scary thought. What we have done as a nation, especially to Israel, will be done to us. That's a thought Jesus said, you know, do unto others as you have them do unto you. That's with the golden rule. That applies to us as individuals. That applies to nations too. As you, have, as you have done, it shall be done unto you. Your reward shall return upon your own head. For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. They shall drink and they shall swallow down and they shall be as though they had not been. God is, see, see, Obadiah, again, just like Joel and the others, he's spanning the centuries. While he lived thousands of years ago, he's prophesying things that are yet to happen. He might not have realized it. But as we read this now and we see the things that are happening in the world today, he says, come on. Now here's the promise. And remember, I said in all these prophecies, there was this, these, these promises of judgment and destruction, but there's always a promise of restoration. There's always a hope. Listen to what Obadiah says. But upon Mount Zion, where's Mount Zion? That's Jerusalem, Israel, where the temple was and will be. Upon Mount Zion shall be what? Deliverance. And there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Listen, the, the nation of Israel is going to have the land that God said they're supposed to have. And it doesn't matter what man does. If you turn to Psalm 2, it says, why did the heathen rage? Or why did the people rage and the heathen imagine a vain thing? They think they could really thwart God's plan and really make God not keep his promises? God will always keep his promises. He says, Upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. And they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken it. Now again, listen, this is speaking of nations, not individuals. Because God can save an Arab. God can save a Palestinian. God can save uh, an American. God can save a Russian. God can save a Chinese. There's, individually, God can save anybody. But he's speaking of the nations of the world, the heathen. 
And they of the south shall possess the mount of Esau, and they of the plain, the Philistines, and they shall possess the fields of Ephraim and the fields of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead, and the captivity of this host of the children of Israel shall possess the land of Canaanites. There's going to be a deliverance of the nation of Israel. And they're going to have every acre of land that God said was theirs. And we know that when Jesus comes back, when Jesus returns, He's going to sit as a king in Jerusalem for a thousand years. And he's going to reign this earth. I'm, this is before the new heaven and new earth. This is before the streets of gold. This is before all that happens. He's going to reign on this planet. And the nation of Israel will judge the nations. It's the promise of the word. And Savior shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Short book, so a short message, okay? But here's the thing. The time is so, to me, it's so exciting to be living in the time that we're living in right now. Because we're seeing these things come to pass. Obadiah lived thousands of years ago. Probably had no clue as to what he was really saying. But we see this stuff unfolding right before our very eyes. How much more should we be about our Father's business when we know we're ever, ever closer to the coming of Jesus Christ? How much more should we be praying? How much more should we be witnessing? How much more should we be encouraging one another in the faith? How much more should we be focused on what Jesus said is important instead of what we've made important. Time is short. It's a serious matter. A lot of people think that the world is going to go on like it's going. See, but I believe in all my heart. And, and I, I, just, I just feel that I, it might be in my lifetime. I don't know how long I'm going to live. But it might be in my lifetime that we see Christ return. Because of all this stuff that's happening. Now, they've, people have been saying that for thousands of years. But there's never been an Israel. There's never been an Arab Spring. There's never been the nations of the world lining up like God said they're supposed to line up. This, this Arab conspiracy that you read about in 83, read that. In Psalm 83, read that. It's like, it's like reading a, a recent history book. All those nations surrounding Israel, a perpetual hatred of Israel. Yet Israel will be victorious. If you're a betting person, bet on Israel. We won't be around to collect it anyway. But I, I, I mentioned there, there, are, there are people today that literally hate Israel. I mentioned about the guy that came in here, I sold him a guitar. And he looked up on the wall and he said, well, you got that Jewish flag up there. You got an American flag. I see an American flag. I see a Jewish flag. He said, what's, what's that about? And I said, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I said, God said, whoever blesses Abraham would be blessed. Whoever curses him would be cursed. And he said, so you think they have a right to be there, huh? I said, yeah. And he left. <laughs> I don't know what, I, I don't think he agreed with me, but maybe he did, I don't know. But there's so many people that they have been, they have been convinced. I preached a message one time, why does Satan hate Israel? <laughs> you know, Satan hates Israel. That's why he tried to gas them out of existence in World War II. That's why he's been trying to wipe them out for the last 2,000 years. Because he knows if he can wipe them out, God can't keep his promises. But you know why there's an Israel today? Because God's going to keep his promises. See, they're not back in, you know, the, the Jews haven't gone back to their land in belief. They still don't. They're, they're still a nation that's rejected because of their unbelief. If you read Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, it talks about that. But there's going to come a time when the Jews, the nation of Israel is going to look on Jesus Christ when he comes back. And they're going to see the, the piercings in his hands. And they're going to realize what they've done. And that's when the nation of Israel will cry out and weep bitterly because of what they've done. And that's when Jesus will wipe away all their tears. 
That's when Jesus will come back. Just like Joseph forgave his brothers, that's when Jesus will say, I'll be your God, you'll be my people. That's when he'll write a new law in their hearts that Jeremiah talked about in chapters 30, 31, 32. See, it's important. It's exciting. I mean, I tell you, it's serious stuff. We need to love the nation of Israel. Doesn't mean we love everything they do. We need to pray for uh, Israel. Our friend John Pissarro was here a while back. said, why should we pray for Jews to be saved, to come to know Jesus as their Messiah? They're God's people. They're his, they're his special chosen people. So anyway, short book, short message tonight, okay? I'm going to let you go early. Anybody have any questions or comments before we close? Any questions or comments? Yes. I don't know. Probably. I, 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 don't, I, I don't know. Uh, I think that's, that's more of the gas companies got mad because they tried to freeze the gas price. <laughs> but I, I don't know. I, it, could, it could be. How many people remember the oil shortage, the gas shortage? Some of you weren't even around here in 73. <laughs> Did you say? Yeah, some, some believe, that's a good point. Yeah, if, if um, well, it's not just that, I've heard a couple different, different things. In, in the Revelation, uh, when it talks about, and if, if uh, well, Jesus on the, on the uh, Olivet Discourse says, when you see these things happen, when you see the abomination of desolation, free into the, flee into the mountains. And I believe it's not just 144,000, but I believe whoever escapes Jerusalem uh, whoever escapes from Israel, will, will, that will be their, their shelter. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a, yeah, that's a good point. That place is there, and I believe that's a place where they'll go and stay for the last three and a half years. Uh, is that the only number of them that will make it? Well, some say uh, in, in, in the Revelation, it talks about 144,000 Jews being sealed to be evangelists. Uh, I personally believe it's not just going to be them. I believe it's going to be Whatever Jews escape Jerusalem. Some people say it's just 144,000, but I believe there's going to be, I believe there's going to be more that are going to escape. It doesn't, it doesn't specifically define Petra as a place that they'll go. But uh, when Jesus said on the, on the Olivet Discourse, he said, when you see these things happen and when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, now we believe that that is... The, uh, when the Antichrist will set himself up in the temple halfway through the tribulation period. So the last three and a half years, for the first three and a half years, everybody's going like, to love one another. It's going to be like, you know. But for that last half, that's when the Jews will flee from Israel. Jesus said, pray that, you know, if, if you're on a rooftop, don't come down to get your stuff. He said, get out. When you see that happen, leave. And... Um, so how many are going to escape there? I don't know. Uh, some, some say the 144,000 of Revelation is that, but I think, I think it'll be more than that. I think it'll be the, whatever population of Israel that is not destroyed will flee to uh, the city of... And again, it's conjecture that it's the city of Petra, but it makes sense because flee to the mountains, he said, flee to the mountains, and that's a place of hiding. So that's, that's kind of a conjectural thing. But they will flee. They will, they will run. And Petra is a good place any, I guess, because it's there, you know. Yes, Chuck. I would think so, yes, because that's where the focus is. I don't know what the uh, effect would be on Jews and other nations, because when, when the persecution starts, I imagine that will splash up. But there will be, there will be uh, Gentile nations who will shelter the Jews, because if you remember at the very end of the Olivet Discourse, Jesus talks about the sheep and the goat judgment. And there'll be nations who will, who will protect the Jews in their midst, and there'll, there'll be nations who will not. So, again, a lot of that stuff in, is, is we, we can only kind of make conjectures about some things based on what the Word says. But I, I believe that the, the Jews in other nations, some will be protected and some will be, some will be, uh, some will be more... Yes. This is where a lot of what you said you that ties in. Yeah. 
Because Daniel talks about uh, the, 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 yeah, the abomination of desolation. You know what? We have, we have a whole series of messages on Daniel, the teaching I did on Daniel. And we'll get you some copies of, of a, because, because it, yeah, it, it, uh, Daniel, to understand Revelation, you've got to understand Daniel. To understand Daniel, you've got to understand Revelation. They're tied in. It, Yeah, they really they really mirror each other in so many different ways, yeah. and uh, Daniel is mainly focused on well, well, both really from Re- Revelation from chapter four onward, focuses more on uh, the earthly scenes are Israel, because the church is caught up. Daniel, like when Daniel talks about the saints, he's not talking about the church; he's talking about Israel. He, he Daniel didn't know anything about any church; he was talking about Israel. So yeah, they go together along with. They're, they're really, and, and a lot of people say the book of Revelation is, it's really, it's really pretty simple. Yeah. It, there's a lot of symbolism. And same way with Daniel. He's pretty straight. He kind of explains himself. And the only thing about Daniel is when you get toward the end, he starts talking about, uh, he starts mentioning you know, periods of time. And there have been a lot of misinterpretations of period of time. Even some folks here have misinterpreted. But... Uh, uh, you know, when you, when you really sit down and you start to understand Daniel, you understand a little bit of history of what happened between the Testaments because Daniel predicts, predicts a lot of things that happen in between the Testaments. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get you. I'll make you. I think, I think, how many parts were there, John, I, from Daniel? I think it was like about 12 or 13 parts. And we'll, we'll, make, we'll make a copy. We'll make a copy for you. And... Uh, of uh, of uh, from Daniel, okay, yeah, fourteen or fifteen, yeah. There's so, but yeah, we'll we'll get your copy, okay. But uh, any other questions or comments uh, before we close? Don't be afraid. You know, Jesus said, when you see these things happen, look up. You know, I I I, I listen to the news and I hear about what's going on in, in Syria and all these other places. You know, it's just he's coming. Jesus Christ is coming. Amen. 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 Okay. If all hearts and minds are clear. Thank you all tonight. Please keep us in your prayer for the next couple of days uh, as we go to our prayer gathering. My house shall be called a house of prayer. Amen. Okay. Let's uh, look to the Lord. Why don't you stand as we close. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. And uh, we ask you, Lord, that you would be with us as we go from this place. Uh, for those, again, who are going to go through testing tomorrow, just pray your hand would be upon them. And uh, Father, and let all the results come back well. And we ask your blessing upon this evening. I pray, God, you would help us tell somebody about Jesus this week. We'll give you all the praise and honor and glory in Jesus' precious name. And all God's children said, amen. Amen. God bless you all. We'll uh, see you next time.